Okay, I think we're live. I have Mark Jacobson today with me, uh, an economist. Do you call yourself an economist? Sure. Okay, good. <laughs> want to make sure, you know, I don't insult anybody by yeah. calling them something they're not. Um, so we're, we're going we're gonna to answer a few questions, but there's only two, so that's not going to take us very long. So instead, we're just going to talk about um, all things energy. And uh, a, another very interesting thing happened. Uh, again today, the price of oil dropped another two bucks. Another two today. Seventy-five twelve. When I just looked at it, um, which is, you know, I cannot figure out energy prices. I don't think anybody really can. It's pretty clear that there's just an enormous amount of speculation in this. You know, the the original idea was that uh, we were overproducing oil. You know, supply had exceeded demand, but only by about a million barrels per day. You know, may, maybe production was up around 92 million barrels per day. Well, oil you know, is very storable, right? So yeah. there's this notion that, that the price should not move. Short-run changes in supply or demand should not really move the price all that much. Yeah. Um, something is moving the price a lot, for sure. <laughs> well, so, well, yeah, so, so there was a bit of, I, I mean, here's the theory, right, that I read, right, which was, okay, there's a little bit of oversupply, and historically, the Saudis have been sort of the, you know, the, the guys who would absorb that, and they would cut back. And uh, the Saudis just decided this summer, about two, two and a half months ago, three months ago, that they were not going to cut back on their market share. In fact, they were going to increase their market share, so they lowered the price to their Asian customers. Uh, they dropped it down to 80-something it was a, a, a little bit above 100 bucks a barrel. Then they dropped down to the 80s, and instantly the market went down. And then a little while after that, they decided, "Oh, we're going to drop the price to the North American market. They don't sell much to us right now. In, in the U.S., we get most of our oil, uh, about half of it domestically, and the rest Canada, Venezuela, and, and Mexico. And we get very little from the Saudis now." But anyway, they decided they were going to discount it us too. Boom, that dropped it. That got it down to 80 bucks a barrel. And that happened over the last, you know, two months or so, which is still a very abrupt, quick drop. Yeah. And there's been speculation, of course, is this because the Saudis are, uh, you know, want to get rid of fracking? Uh, you know, because of, in theory, when the price gets down to about 80 bucks a barrel, maybe fracking isn't, isn't so economic. Um, Surely the oil sands in Canada are... Uh, out around around eighty, yep, maybe even around hundred. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. They're they're absolutely taking a beating. Although those are you know Exxon's invested heavily in those, <laughs> so they can take a beating for a while and still keep going. But at any rate, then over the last couple of weeks, you know, people thought, oh, OPEC will kind of get their act together and they'll cut, uh, you know, they'll they'll cut their production a little bit, and this will send a message to the market that there's a floor of eighty dollars a barrel. And the, and the Saudis did the exact opposite. Uh, a couple of days ago, they said, nope, we're not cutting back one bit. Uh, in, in fact, we're happily increase our market share. So now there's a theory that they're sort of doing this, and it's a, it's double benefit. For, I mean, there, there, there's obviously 20 bucks a barrel less when you're selling 9 million barrels a day. That's 180 million bucks a day. That the Saudis are are not getting that they were getting previously, so so they're taking some economic hit on this. But on the other hand, it sort of you know pounds the the frackers in the United States, and if you put them out of business by doing this for a year, it will take them many many years to recover from that. Um, so there, there's some idea that you know they're doing this to treat you know kind of slow down the fracking craze in the United States. Other people think they're doing this to hurt the Iranians, to do, and then a lot of people just think, you know what, the Saudis don't really control the price of oil anyway, and they're simply, you know, they could, they could cut two or three million barrels a day, and the price is still going to go down. So I think it'll be very interesting over the next six months to see what happens. It is quite clear that at 75 bucks a barrel, a lot of the production that we have around the world right now is not economically viable. That's that's fracking is certainly half of that is out. Uh, you know, like Mark said, the, the tar sands, uh, you know, are, are going to take a beating. And so it's really interesting to see what happens. But it's also interesting to see how long that price will stay down. 
So it's conceivable that this is a bit of a what we call a green paradox, also, right? That okay. if there's enough, um, if, if say electric vehicles um, look like they're doing well enough, if it looks like China is maybe not building as much freeway capacity around its cities as had been thought, say, um, looking forward, then of course what happens is the price of oil goes down coming back from the future to the present. Because if, if you realize there's not a huge market for oil in 20 years, uh, why leave it in the ground for the next 20 years? It should come out of the ground now when the price is at least still 70. So paradox, because if you announce a really strict policy uh, for the future, or if you if you discover, okay. uh, if you were to discover some biofuel that was that was yeah. economically viable at you know fifty dollars, or looked like it was going to get get there, um, the price of oil would go down immediately, even before that biofuel went into production, because people okay. would see it coming uh, and realize that they had to sell their oil now before uh, uh, before it got too cheap or, or was there no demand left. Yeah, it, anyway. and and I honestly think that. There has been an enormous uh, change in the attitude of people toward electric cars in the last several oh, yes, months. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I, I told you guys before, and I was just mentioning this to Mark when, when before we turned on. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to him. Um, all of my <laughs> friends, all of my rich Republican friends, have now. I don't have that many, but I do have a couple. Have gone out and bought Teslas. Uh, I think five of my friends have bought them in, in the last two or three months. Uh, part of that is to just show how green they are, and part of them because Tesla is a really nice car. It goes really fast, very comfortable on the inside, and then they can be kind of snooty about, oh, look, I'm doing my part for green energy. What are you guys doing? And at the same time, still have a really nice car. But, but you know, I just bought this little Ford Focus and, uh, you know, pulled it up to my favorite coffee shop a couple weeks ago. And three of the other kind of old surfers like me in there said, oh, I've got the leaf, I've got the, and sort of, so I, I think people in the States now who can afford these, they're, they're a little more expensive than gas cars, but I think the people who can't afford these are now buying them. And, and in many ways, it's sort of like, I think what happened with the smartphones about six or seven years ago, you know, everybody had a flip phone and we kind of all were used to having phones. And then a few people bought iPhones and then the Android or whatever. And then pretty soon everybody had to have one. Right, it's like well, you just have to keep up, and I kind of think that has happened with electric cars. Now, yeah, it'll take course cars last a lot longer than phones. So right, it'll take a long time for that to happen. Yeah, but I just think there's been that enormous change, and you know, I I, I think energy is going to be really interesting over the next uh, couple of years. Okay, mm -hmm. now we're going to ask some questions because they I don't know why they've suddenly started, started to show up on my thing. Popping. They started to populate. Okay, could you elaborate? Okay, this is one for me. A little on how PCR, that's, that's polymerase chain reaction for you economists. Process works in analyzing algae ponds for problem. Yeah, this is a totally cool one. So, so the way this works, and Sapphire Energy and lots of the other algae companies do this. And in, 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 in fact, all agriculture does this now. And that is uh, when a pest or pathogen comes into your crop, if you can catch it early and get rid of it, that's an enormous advantage. I mean, that's probably true in medicine as well, right? But, but you know, if, if you catch those guys early, it's really easy to treat the pond when it's only, you know, one chytrid per 10,000 algae rather than when it's kind of gone through the roof. So what do they do? You, you sample the pond every day and using polymerase chain reaction and a set of uh, specific primers, you amplify pieces of DNA that are unique for the pathogens that you know could impact your pond. So, uh, so, so you're gonna get things like chytrids and some bacteria, and then you're gonna get some grazers like protozoan and uh, you know, maybe daphnia or, or some of the other ones. And if you identify, and, and so PCR is super sensitive because you're doing this by DNA amplification, you can find something that is one in a million, which is very difficult if you were just trying to look for these things visually. Okay, but by PCR, you can you can spot these guys really early. Now, in the case of um, let's say a chytrid infection, that's a fungus infection. The the algae guys have learned that hey, if I change the nitrogen that I'm putting into the pond, you know whether I use urea or one of the other nitrogens, I can actually impact 
those chytrids. And so they, they, they can just slightly switch the media and actually slow these guys down. You could also think about using antifungal agents. They're very expensive and you try not to use those. But if by doing PCR analysis, you see, uh-oh, this chytrid infection is starting to take off, well, it, you'll put that expensive chemical in to save your crop. So that's the way PCR works. Um, it's just simply a, a method of using DNA application to very sensitively tell who's in the pond. Mm -hmm. Ah, here, that's why questions are showing up because somebody explained how to do it. Okay, here's one for Mark. We're going to answer this one. And it says, Dr. Jacobson, can you explain why price regulations don't work in some situations? Yes, please. <laughs> in some situations. Well, there's, I mean, the, the, the main one that, that um, gets talked about a lot with respect to fuel economy is, and also a lot of other energy regulations, is that people aren't paying attention to the price. Uh, of the energy and and this you could easily imagine this happening in home electricity consumption for example right. Maybe more easily than cars. Yeah, and so a lot of people don't know how much electricity costs per kilowatt hour They're not sure about this block rate pricing where it's cheap per kilowatt hour to start with and then at the end It's very expensive per kilowatt hour And so if you ask someone well really if you replace your pool pump or change your light bulb uh, How much are you gonna save it, it can be difficult to um, to figure out Right? And, and so in situations like this where there's what, what might be called inattention to energy prices or to utility bills, uh, this is a case where a price, if you raise the price of it, people simply won't notice and they'll just yeah. keep doing what they've always done. Um, with, with oil uh, and gasoline, uh, people seem to notice the price. A lot of people could tell you more or less what gasoline costs on a, on a given day. Uh, if you share, arrive with someone, people will often exchange money uh, at the end of the trip to try and cover some of the gas or pay for some of the gas. So there's this recognition that, that gasoline does cost uh, money, and, and we see that. A lot of evidence of that in the used car market, actually. When gasoline prices change, uh, uh, Steve's you know, focus is going to increase in value uh, if, if the Saudis back up, right? Because, because people will, uh, people sort of understand that. They see those prices. So, but, but one key, key situation where they don't work is if people are ignoring during the price. So, I, I, so, so, you know, I have to say guilty is charged on the electrical bill, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, gasoline, well, now I have an electric car, but, but gasoline, I, you knew the price because every week, you, you know, you pulled in and filled it up. And then you really, because what you really always notice is the change, right? Yeah. Oh, last week I filled it for $38 yeah, and now I filled the same week, tank and, and it's 50 bucks. Yeah, Ouch, yeah. That, that, I'm alarmed by that. But, but your electric bill sort of comes once a month and, you know, okay, you pay it. And, and some people but, have automatic payment now. Yeah. They don't even see it uh, yeah. in a given month, right? So it's sort of yeah. never, uh, there's this lack of salience. So. Yeah. So, so I, I, I have to say I'm not sure <laughs> what my electric <laughs> bill is. Well, I kind of know it was about 200 yeah. bucks a month, but only because I'm thinking about putting – photovoltaic, oh, I am putting photovoltaics on my house. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't know that at all. I did know that there was, uh, you know, price tiers, which I, I, I did know that it was, um, you know, much cheaper to use this from midnight to 6 a.m. when no one wants it, and much more expensive to use electricity between 2 and 7 at night. Well, for the utility company, but not yep. for you personally, actually. I thought it was. I thought no, we so had the, the tiers. The, tier, the tiers have to do with... Um, Oh, uh, total, total usage use. over the month, right? Yeah. Which is interesting. So if you take someone who has a relatively small household and a low electric bill, um, like me, I assume, yeah. uh, I, can, I can change to all LED lighting or something and not save anything. I won't get nearly what it says on the package because yeah. my electricity rate is much lower because I'm still in the first tier. Got it. If you have uh, a bigger house, a pool, something like that, you'll be in a much higher tier. Right. If you change your light bulbs, you might be saving more than it says on the package yep. uh, because you're on this higher tier. And so there's this sort of, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that calculation. Sometimes. Yeah, and, and the deal I get now uh, with the electric car is if I agree to charge it only between midnight and 6 a.m., and that's really easy to oh, right. do. Yeah, yeah. Well, the utility company wants you to do that. Yeah, so the utility company wants you to do that, right? Because that's when they have low demand. So now electricity I, is cheap for them because mm -hmm. it comes from coal. Mm -hmm. uh, you do you do realize that there's a bit of a, 
a bit of a no, I know that an odd situation there I, too, right? I, I, if you charge I, I in the afternoon when it's expensive, you're getting clean electricity. If you charge yeah. at night when it's cheap, you're getting the, yep. the dirty electricity. No, no, I, I, I do realize that, <laughs> but right. it's also a chicken or the egg problem, it which is, is yeah. until you have enough electric cars on the grid and you're really using it, then you know we're not going to convert over something no. else. But anyway, the deal they, they they give to me is so, and I just tell my car. You know, because they're they're little computers now. Actually, they're mm -hmm. big computers now. Okay, only charge between one and five a.m. Mm -hmm. So my car starts charging at the night. You know, at, at one o one a.m. and mm -hmm. finishes about three thirty or so, mm -hmm. depending upon how much I've used. In exchange for that, I get the ultra cheap rate all day. All right. Oh, nice. So I called have time of use two, and what that means is I now have the lowest rate you can pay twenty four seven. Right. And so that's the trade off that the utility makes because, you know, my. You're sure helping they, them by charging I'm, at night, you're exactly. evening their load out. I'm evening yeah. their load out, yeah. right? Now, of course, once I put uh, photovoltaics on top of my house, then I'm at neutral. So it doesn't really help me. It doesn't matter if I have time to use or not. Yeah, I will continue. That. Yeah, yeah. I Well, I will continue to only charge between, you know, 1 a.m. And, and 5 a.m. Right, because it's well, unless your solar panels are. I guess you can feed that back into the grid. So you, that's all you do. You just yeah. run the meter back, right? I mean, if I was home, I'd plug it in and I'd actually get straight solar into it. But yeah. I, I, I just come out neutral on that one. Okay. Anyway, this is a really interesting question, and I'm hoping that Mark took some time to actually see what the latest one is because I saw the headlines and have not read the deal yet. What do you think of the latest China-U.S. climate change deal? Is it enough? How will we get to their targets? Did you take a look at that the yet? Targets of the deal. Um, well, I, I think one bilateral deal in itself is is not enough. Um, but it's it's the, the point has been made in the last few years that there's really very few countries, sort of the, the top six or eight emitters, particularly if you count the European Union as a single block, mm -hmm. uh, is almost everything, right? So we have yeah. these big attempts to get international agreements with dozens and dozens of interested parties and yep. they don't really go anywhere. Yep. And if you could get a sequence of bilateral deals, so if this is just the first in a, in a sequence of bilateral things, maybe the next one is the US and Europe or uh, Australia and China or something, right? And so if you see this sort yep. of a sequence of bilateral deals, you can build your way to, a, um, to, to reductions of will be quite meaningful, I think. Yeah. Um, and so this is, a, it's, it's very hopeful in that sense that this is the first of a, um, a sort of bilateral, bilateral arrangements, right? Um, yeah, and just by numbers, us and, you know, between the US yeah, and China, US that's 50% of, of, of right. the CO2, right? So that's it's right. not a trivial. That's right. Of course, China's obligation under this deal is, is out in the future a ways, yeah. uh, which means that, that we need some other bilateral deals with countries that are willing to move faster, yeah. say they're already industrialized fully, uh, so they're not as concerned about, about uh, yeah. build out of their infrastructure, say. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, how will the U.S. get to their targets? Well, that's that's interesting. We'll see. Uh, the clean. I suggest you look at uh, EPA's clean power plan, so that's going to be the first big piece in this. Yeah. Uh, is is our efforts to scale back electricity emissions from electricity? That's the name, clean power plant. Uh, it's going to be state by state, and the states will be able to try and harmonize their plans if they want to. Now, of course, we know that states don't always uh, play nicely together, but but uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> they do. And groups occasionally, of them, groups, the West groups Coast of them can. Right? I, I so, see that the West Coast has at least all agreed yeah. to have similar. Uh, Cap and trade, right between us and Washington and Oregon. It, 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 yes, at the moment, although EPA's clean power plan may shake all that up. Although okay. presumably some of those agreements will survive uh, okay. going forward to meet our obligations under under okay. clean power plan. But I take take a look at uh, it has four building blocks of this plan, and they talk about how they're mm -hmm. going to reduce. There's uh, basically you keep running the nuclear and wind and so on, and clean so you know CO two wise clean facilities mm -hmm. as much as you can. Uh, they want to increase natural gas and reduce coal, uh, and then improve the efficiency a little bit of existing coal plants. Those are basically the steps, and I think they can yeah. get some piece, at least, of this reduction, significant piece of this. Yeah, that way. and I, I guess by first principles, it seems reasonable that China puts theirs off, you, you know, their reductions into the future. 
um, simply because right now they're trying to build out their electric grid and, and bring electricity to all the communities, which we already have. Mm -hmm. And and to attempt to tell a country that, uh, you know, because they delayed, uh, you know, deployment of their electric grid, that oh now you guys can't do that at all. Uh, I, I I don't know. I I, I guess when I look, this at is the, the argument reason, they always make, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that you know you guys have been developed for a long time and pumping CO two into the air yep. for decades. A lot of it's yep. uh, we're just in a growth state. but of course you know at some point. Uh, we say, look, you know, China's energy intensity is yeah, getting close to getting ours. close to ours, or getting close to it's not not anywhere near there yet, but but it yeah. it may be in in before twenty thirty. So well, they put out more CO two than us, well, right, but, but then again, they have four time, four, four times four, the population, yeah, right? right now. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, rate, I will say that yesterday I had a visit uh, from one of the Chinese uh, energy companies, the the chairman of one of them, um, and they're very interested in carbon sequestration technology. You know, that they realize that their coal plants uh, are, are dumping out a huge amount of CO2. And now they view in China, this is also part of their air problem, right? And mm -hmm. of course, anybody who's seen the pictures of Beijing and Shanghai and the rest of them, they got some serious problems there on air quality. So, so uh, the Chinese government is putting in several billion over the next couple of years. He was a little vague on how long that is, but several billion over the next couple of years to do carbon capture and sequestration. And the reason they came to see us is because several of uh, the companies in, in China who are, who are doing, uh, who, are, who are deploying technologies to capture CO2 from point sources. So his company specifically captures it from coal-fired power plants and from cement plants. And, uh, and rather than bury this stuff underground, which they think is silly, they want to get a beneficial reuse of that. So that means, can they take that CO2 and feed it to algae and then make some product out of that? Which feeds into your question now. Okay, that feeds into this question, okay. And then we've got a great one from Mark because we're, okay. If bio crude from algae is similar to regular crude and therefore processed into gasoline, jet fuel, et cetera, like regular crude, then this tech, then this technology still contributes to carbon dioxide emission and does nothing to reduce the world's carbon footprint. Well, okay, so uh, it's true that the CO2 that comes out of a tailpipe, um, whether you have, uh, you know, bio crude or green crude is exactly the same. So when you go down to the gas station and you, you grab that gas pump and fill up your car, it's, indistinguishable at that point forward whether that you know that that gasoline came from crude oil pumped out of the ground or came from bio crude your car is going to burn it the same and it's going to put the same amount of co2 out into the atmosphere so what's the difference and why do we say that these are low carbon fuels the difference is that the crude oil that came out of the ground fossil fuel has been underground for 200 to 300 million years so that was sequestered co2 and you've now pulled it out of the ground and you released it into the atmosphere. So you have a net gain of CO2 into the atmosphere. Green crude or bio crude, the oil in that got there by pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the process of photosynthesis. Or from the power plant. Or from the power plant, right? You, from, yeah, from, from any CO2 source, right? But, but, but the process of photosynthesis is sunlight and CO2 and I make hydrocarbons. So that the every CO2, every carbon molecule that's in green crude was carbon dioxide the week or two before, and that was simply captured and put into the algae. So we call that a net uh, you know, reuse or, or a beneficial reuse of carbon. It's not net zero. The reason it's not zero, and some people say, oh, then it's carbon neutral, right? Because since every carbon molecule that is in the bio crude came from CO2 the week before, then I must be net zero gain of CO2 to the atmosphere. The reason that's not true is because it takes some energy to grow the algae, it takes some energy to process the algae, and it takes some energy to convert that oil into crude oil. And now, if you got that energy from photovoltaic or from some other renewable source, like for example, you just took 20% of the crude oil that you're making and use that to power the entire system, then it would be net zero. 
but right now we actually don't do that, right? Right now what we do is we take electricity off the grid to mix the ponds. We take electricity off the grid to pump the air and the CO2 into them. So there is some net energy consumption in the process of growing it. So it's not truly carbon neutral. It's about a 30% reduction. So we can actually measure these things. We do, it's called the life cycle assessment. And we measure these things. And, and for green crude from algae, it's a 70% reduction in CO2. I think as we get more clever going forward and we learn how to be more efficient in growing this stuff, and then as we learn to start to take other renewable energy forms, wind, solar, geothermal, you know, is one of them that, I, that I've seen people are starting to use now for this. Uh, then, then in theory, we could get that down to a true carbon footprint of zero. But it'll, but it'll be a while before we get there. But right now, listen, a 70% reduction would be an enormous benefit. In fact, if you got a 70% reduction and couple that with more efficient engines, you know, th then you're making a real dent. Okay, now there was a really good question that I wanted. Here's one right here. This one's from Mark. We're going to put him on the spot. It says, can you identify smart economic policies around the world in terms of renewable energy technology development and carbon emission reduction? I want to hear about these. Well, that's always, it's always tough, right? And the challenge in policy is, is trying to pick winners, right? And we have a yep. long history of, of not always picking the winners, right? Picking technologies, mandating them when maybe it was too early, or maybe there was a competitor that, that turned out to do better. Um, so the, you know, most economists would, would fall back and say, well, the smartest policy is just to let the market sort it out. Okay, now we know that the, we know that the market isn't going to solve environmental problems by itself, so there has right. to be some incentive put there, right. but to, to use the, the sort of the way the markets work in order to do this, right? So drive the price of oil up, um, and wait for people to figure out algae or mm -hmm. electric cars or whatever it might be, right? Uh, in some sense, I I do find it interesting that that you know Dr. Mayfield is is competing with his own. You, know, you have an electric car which competes <laughs> yeah, with your yeah. own technology. Yeah. Right? Yes, um, yeah. I'm hedging but, my bets. <laughs> hedging your bets. Right? <laughs> so so the you know the, the the point is that. Government could back one or the other or both of those, and indeed, of mm -hmm. course, we do, right? Government backs both of those currently, mm -hmm. uh, hoping that one will emerge, say, of, of those and, and a whole suite of other things. Um, and, and that's fine. I think it's, it's, it's not smart to put all your eggs in one basket, right? It, it, you either need to try and subsidize lots of different technologies and right. see which one actually emerges and which ones fail, uh, or try and raise the prices of fossil energy. Yeah, uh, and let these these come into place, right? And so, so one point is that um, well, British Columbia is often a, a poster child of this, right? So British Columbia has a carbon tax uh, that raises the price of fossil energy. Now, of course, British Columbia is too small to really influence innovation, right? Uh, so what you would need to do is see these prices rise in large economies uh, mm -hmm. around the world to really have the private sector step in and say oil is really expensive now, or at least the consumer price of oil is really expensive because of a tax, let's see if we can put some resources into developing alternatives, yeah. right? Um, and so, yeah, so, so anyway, but if enough countries were to raise the price, that would presumably be the smartest, the smartest policy. Other than that, it's, I think, the, the approach of just look, subsidizing lots of things yeah. and, and trying to let people do the best they can and see who emerges uh, on top. You know, is it electrics? Is it biofuels? Is it yep. mass transit, high-speed rail? All these things are substitutes for one another. All these things are substitutes for yep. for, for for oil, really. Yeah. So I, I know that Josh uh, Graf Zivin, uh, you know, when he talked last year uh, in, in my class, pointed out that one of the best ways to do this is calculate what the actual, you know, the externalities, what the real cost of burning fossil fuel is, right? And th those could be health costs. Those could be, uh, you know, the way we subsidize with tax break. You know, all the subsidies that we put into that. Plus all, you know, what it really costs the environment and what it really costs uh, the economy. Calculate what that, you know, that, that cost is and put it into dollars and put a tax onto fossil fuel equal to that, right? So, so that, that levels the playing field. Because in my mind, the biggest problem right now, and I hear, you know, I, I still see this, right, all the time, right? I, I just saw that uh, 
the governor of Indiana said, oh, it's completely, these EPA rules are completely unfair for Indiana because we burn, you know, a large amount of coal. And, you know, it's... Oh, they, you know, they got a much... The, the, these states all got a much weaker target. Uh, uh, yeah, power, of course. But, yeah. But, but, but this is the thing that just amazes me, right? Because, you know, people come out and say this, oh, this is completely unfair to us because these new rules are going to put a tax on us. Well, gee, in the meantime, you're spewing out, you know, all, all of your coal and causing acid rain on every state east of you and trashing their forest. I mean, before we, you know, put the restraints in to get sulfur out of coal, you know, acid rain was wiping out the lakes and the trees and of all of New England. So, you know, the, the sort of cheap coal in Indiana and, and Kentucky and Illinois and the rest of the places that were burning it were causing enormous economic consequences to the downwind states. And yet somehow they thought that was perfectly okay. Well, it's not in their right. state. Right? Yeah, because it wasn't in their state, well, right? It's, it's like dump, dump the trash over the fence. I'll try to and then, the comments. Right? Yeah, but... So, so this is now sort of the same thing, except rather than just be acid rain, this is climate change from putting out CO2. So I, I, I just think that we just have to have the nerve, right, the, the political cojones. To raise to, the to, price and exactly. let our innovators innovate exactly. and actually get something to, to, for it. Exactly, right? and solve the real problem they're making. And why we keep dodging that one, it just drives me nuts. Right. Well, I, I blame economists. Yeah, you blame economists. <laughs> We've always been. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I will say the last, the last bit here is to really, okay. you know, you can see it now with oil prices falling, yep. right? I mean, this is bad for the electric car industry. This yep. is bad for renewables, yep. right? And so, and, and, and it's very clear, right? And yes, they could, they'll turn around and say, we need more subsidies now from the government yeah. in order to push our stuff because because oil is yeah. so cheap we're competing with something that's become really cheap yeah uh, it just sort of points to this sort of you really have to make it more expensive to use oil. you can't just tell people yeah. don't use this stuff you know we're gonna yeah. keep it really cheap it's gonna be cheap for you we know you like low gas prices and stuff but yeah. please don't use it right don't yeah. drive so much don't don't buy gasoline cars right it's very very expensive and very difficult to convince people to do that if it's still so cheap to drive and still so cheap to drive in those uh, gas tank. Yeah, and, and, and that flows right into this question, right, which is, at what gas price do you think Americans will make serious behavioral yes. change? Fuel, you know, conservation, you, you know, electric vehicle adoption, et cetera. Is there a tipping point? So, uh, you know, Mark probably has a better answer to this than me, but I, but I will say this. A couple years ago, I was at a meeting and uh, one of the engineers from Chrysler uh, got up and he said, oh, we kind of, we, you know, we've kind of done that analysis. We actually know where that number is. And, and at that time, this was in 2012, gas had hit just about four something, it was the last time it spiked, four, four some odd a gallon. And, and already people were cutting back a little bit. He said, yeah, yeah, people will cut back a little bit at about 450, but they'll make serious changes at $6 and they had an exact number, six seventy, six dollars and 70 cents. He said at that price, people stop running errands, right? They, they pool everything and only drive one day a week and hit all the different stores they've got to go. And he said at that price today in 2012, fuel, you know, would be dramatically changed. And, and I assume, you know, that because he was Chrysler, they probably know those numbers pretty well. Yes, no, that's, I mean, that's as good. As I was, I was going to say that, that you'd probably start to see big effects at five or six. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the issue is that a lot of the effects you'll see are very long term, right? So, so many Europeans pay eight or nine dollars a gallon yep. um, and still happily drive a fair amount, but they're probably not driving for their commute or taking rail or trolley or something for the commute. They probably live a lot closer to work uh, than we do in this country. Right? And those things, building that infrastructure or rebuilding it uh, in many cities in the U.S., um, and getting people to move closer to where they work and move closer to the store and move closer to the restaurants and, yep. and whatever, wherever they want to go, uh, people can live closer together, and they do in, in, in a lot of parts of the world where gas is expensive, but that is a very slow process. Right? And so even though there might be a tipping point at $6, uh, That's you, right. you're not going to see these sort of big changes for, for decades after we reach the tipping points, right? So it, it's a sort of long versus short run tipping. Yeah, uh, interesting point there. Now, electric. I mean, electric cars are very cheap to drive, as you're discovering. Yeah, and so, so, I think there's potential for that technology, even even at fairly low gas prices. 
if yeah. battery costs come down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as you also pointed out just a minute ago, you know, when you buy a car, I, I only leased mine for three years, but, but I did that, uh, you know, making the assumption that battery technology and electric cars were going to improve dramatically over the next couple of years because so many more people are getting them and because Tesla and other companies now are really competing. You know, I think before when there were only a couple options on electric vehicles, there wasn't really that opportunity for new innovation. You know, do you think to, the car manufacturers are going to take a beating on all these leases? Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, well, I, you know, who knows? I mean, some of this may be, especially on the battery, you may be able to plug and play, meaning that so if, they if, can recondition, they can it, redo it. it yes, somehow. exactly. So, yeah. so the only reason I did not uh, buy the Focus, size is great. The thing accelerates wonderfully. I have to say, you know, I was getting on the freeway last night, and I, they, they have what's called an energy coach in these things now. It's kind of okay. funny. It, and it tells you how fast you're driving and how good your fuel is and when you come to a stop, how much of the energy you recapture. So it's kind of nice. It's actually teaching you how to drive much more energy efficient in the car while they're doing it. And, and part of that, which you learn very quickly, is slow accelerations and slow braking are much more energy efficient. I mean, I think we kind of knew that. But at any rate, so, so I haven't really, you know, sort of taken the car and seen how zippy it really is. But getting on, you know, Interstate 5 last night at, at 6.30, you know, there was, there was a truck coming, <laughs> coming behind me, and he clearly wasn't going to give an inch. So, you know, I, I floored the thing as hard as I could. I was going about 40 getting on. And it got up to 70 really quick. I mean, three or four seconds, and I was up there. I have to say I was pretty impressed. So based upon that, I would buy the car and be happy with it for the next 20 years. Size is fine, fits four people. You know, everything's great, except it only gets 85 or 90 miles fully charged. Mm -hmm. And that means I can't really drive it. Like, you know, if I want to go see my sister or brother up in, you know, San Luis Obispo, I can't make it there. Mm -hmm. that's that's 200 and some odd miles to get up there and I couldn't stop halfway well, I guess I could you know yes. stop halfway up and charge it now uh, the high-end Tesla's have 240 mile electric range and they charge much faster so. and and they and they, they charge charging. much faster too so those things you can do this rapid charge and in 30 minutes you can get half of that so you can get 120 miles in 30 minutes that means I could drive up you know I could go almost all the way to San Francisco on one charge. That means I could get halfway up there, stop in to have, you know, my, my double espresso and, you know, veggie salad and, and, and plug in the charger and make it. So if they could come up with better, better battery technology and I could just pop it out and pop it back in, boy, I, I would be set and that would be it. That would be my only car. So, and I think that will show up in the next couple of years. Tesla clearly already has it. I don't know how much of that is they have a better battery than the Ford does versus how much of it is they just have more batteries in their car. I, I haven't looked in to know which, which of those is true. I'm sure it's a combination of a little bit of both. But, you know, an improvement in those two things over the next couple of years, and then I'm, I'm not going back. Okay? Let's see. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Oh, oh, here's one. We kind of already answered this, but, I, but you know, I'll, I'll just ask the question and see if we have anything else. Okay, Professor Zivin talked about taxes on various energy sources based upon their level of social harm. This sounds fair, but is there any chance whatsoever that such taxes would be implemented at the national level? So that's kind of what we were just talking about. There right? are other options to get the money. Yeah. Um, so this is one, I'll, I'll just say quickly, this is a um, one thing about energy or carbon or pollution taxes that that's, is very important is what happens to the money. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons people are so concerned, a lot, a lot of sort of the voting public is concerned about a carbon tax or an energy tax because the sense is this will raise my electricity price and mm -hmm. I'll never see the money again, mm -hmm. um, is, is a plan for what you do with it, right? So when Australia yeah. implemented their carbon tax, they were very explicit uh, that they were going to reduce the payroll tax okay. um, and, and, the, and keep their social security system running. Okay. Right? Now, of course, they've since repealed their carbon tax, right? So even yep. even when you're Tony even, Abbott. even when you're explicit about how you're giving the money back, uh, it's still always more popular to have neither yeah. a carbon tax nor a payroll tax, right? That's better yeah. than, but but whatever. If there's there's some you know uh, uh, sense of where the money goes, I think that really uh, it makes a big difference, right? So yeah, and and uh, in, if you 
if we stayed in California, we could reduce the sales tax, increase the carbon tax. Uh, there's bumper stickers that say tax bads, not goods. Right, so you can have the same level of overall tax in your society, but just be using yeah. that tax to discourage people from from things that are harmful, uh, like pollution. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it's not necessary to increase the level of aggregate average taxation in your in your economy. Yeah. To do and, this. And and maybe just say a little bit if you could uh, about what we do here in California, which is cap and trade. So I'll. I'll to you. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult uh, in the United States, I, I would say almost impossible right now, to introduce a new tax. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's a group of people who just won't put up with it. It doesn't matter even if you cut another one. They're just like, no new taxes, right? We only cut taxes. But, but one thing that, that kind of shocks me that people do allow is you put on something called a cap and trade. And what that means is you say, okay, whatever amount of CO2 you're putting out now, you're capped at that. And then in the future, if you want to put out more CO2, you've got to trade with somebody else who's putting out less. Mm -hmm. And you can, and, and that trade can be you can buy it or you, you can actually somehow physically trade it. So that essentially becomes a tax, but it becomes a tax that comes in over time. And so people are more well, accepting of that. because tax it, in over time also. There's no reason. In fact, that's what British Columbia did. Okay. Right. And so, so again, I, I encourage you to read the story uh, in British Columbia, folks, okay. there, because it's it's um, fascinating. I mean, they they their uh, chief politician, I don't know, I just don't know what they have, governors yeah. or whatever it might be, yeah. uh, apparently became convinced this was a good idea and phased it in over time, and it has been a, a grand success. Uh, but but um, cap and trade is equivalent to a tax in the sense that it creates a price for CO two. Yeah. Uh, uh, with the revenue from the tax, right? So if you if cap and trade has created a price of five dollars a ton, that's the same thing as a tax of five dollars a ton. Mm -hmm. But where the revenue from that tax has been given to whoever you gave the permits to. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so in California, we give about eighty percent of the permits to utilities, uh, to um, retailers of electricity, and so on. And, we, and about twenty percent of the permits are given to the government. Uh, who then auctions them in and therefore gets the gets okay. the money, right? So think of think of cap and trade in California. Okay, the price is about ten dollars. So think yeah. of cap and trade in California as a a tax of ten dollars, where eighty percent of the revenue from that tax of ten dollars is given to polluters, utilities, and twenty percent of that revenue goes to the state and can be used to improve funding for things or cut other taxes. So right. so why to the utilities? Why did they get eighty percent of them? I mean, they're the obviously they're the big CO two. They're, they're the folks because well, that was they, sort of existing. That was their. They yeah. would argue that the reason they should get the money is because they're the ones who have to put in the effort to build the renewables yep. and and so on. Um, yeah. So. Okay. The, it's uh, I will say that that this is largely believed to be way too much money to, to be giving them. That, that really, <laughs> the, the amount you need to give them is not necessarily 80%, but they yes. could actually still yeah. function fine with somewhat less than that of the yeah. tax revenue. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, that's, that's, They had good lobbyists. They, I guess. they did very well. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some, and, and, and will that change over time? Or is that it sort will, of fixed? It will over time, right? So over time, they're okay. going to be giving less and less of it to them, right? So the state, okay. I believe in the end, the state is going to get as much as 80% of the revenue and only 20% will go to the, yeah. um, the utilities. Yeah, but I know one of the things that, that you work on is sort of how people, you know, adopt and adapt, you know, to, to fuels, et cetera. But, but, but for the utility industry right now, you know, seeing this change in electric cars and people putting photovoltaics, on, on top of their their roofs, et cetera. Th this must be a uh, I, I would think a stressful you know time for them. Sort of traditionally, you know, their job was you know buy electricity and run it through their their wires and sell it to people. And now the times are changing, right? I, I mean, yeah, the, so, the, so the guys who's putting a photovoltaic on my house is talking to me about going completely off the grid. Oh, there's these new battery storage technologies where you could put these right. in, and and if we put a little more on, well, that's right, and and this is a very interesting point, which is that the the, the grid provides uh, reliability, right. right? So if you were to experience some problem with your solar system, or yep. it was cloudy for a long time, yep. or there was a forest fire and there was smoke or whatever, yep. um, 
they would provide that reliability and they used to just pay for the reliability out of everybody's monthly bill. Yeah. And now what's happening is that people who install solar have very low monthly bill. Right. And people who don't install solar have the same monthly bill they always did. But this isn't providing as much money to the utility to maintain the lines That's and right. provide provide reliability, right? And it's also you could argue it's unfair in the yeah. sense that that people without solar are subsidizing the people with solar in the sense mm -hmm. that the, it's the ones without solar who are paying for all the transmission lines, mm -hmm. all that reliability, right, that, that even the people who have solar get to enjoy. Thank you, right. everybody, for subsidizing me. Yes, you're welcome. So, so, uh, so, yeah, so there's this question of how, how best to pay for yep. infrastructure that's providing not necessarily electricity all the time to people with solar, but it, it provides reliability all yep. the time. Uh, yep. And so how, how to make people with solar pay for so, yeah, interesting question. Not very popular among the solar advocates, right? To suggest that. Uh, yeah. So it, it's. But I think it's in, in, phasing it in. But but I believe that um, SDG and E, when they revamp their fees, which they're going to do January first, two thousand and fifteen. Bigger flat component. Yep. Yep. There's going to be a online charge for me, even though you know my my electric use may be zero. I'm still going to have to pay to be connected to the grid, and apparently I don't get a vote on that. You know, I'm paying to fill potholes and stuff too now. Yeah. Right, because I because our our gasoline taxes, a lot of our gasoline yeah. taxes go to filling potholes yeah. and building roads and stuff. Yeah. And and Dr. Mayfield doesn't pay gasoline taxes <laughs> anymore, uh, and so he gets to enjoy the roads and the reliable <laughs> electric service without paying for any of it. So, I had no so, idea so, what a bad so. citizen I become <laughs> by getting an electric car. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that is actually true. So I saw that the other day too. So this is a this is a serious problem in California. Although, look, although let's be fair, we brought uh, some of that on ourselves. Well, not only so did we bring that some of ourselves, cars do not create potholes, right? Potholes are almost so. universally created by big heavy trucks. Cars simply don't weigh enough to break up asphalt. And uh, so that that's another little thing that's kind of gone on for a long time. Is it's actually the big we. Cars subsidize all the big heavy trucks uh, on all, the road. All of us pay for it. Yeah, pay for yeah. a truck. Yeah. 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 So apparently life is not fair. Who knew? <laughs> okay. Uh, here's one last algae question that I get an answer, and it says, "How risky would an algae biofuels business be in developing countries nowadays?" Wow. So Mark gets to, to gets to answer part of this as well because that I think that's an economic question. So um, you know, certainly the guys who were over here yesterday from China. Um, you know, they're very aggressively going after this. The government is very supportive of things that uh, will sequester um, CO2. And, and in fact, you know, they, they sort of offered that, hey, if we go and build one of these facilities, we might get as much as 50% of that paid for, either by reduced taxes or by, by sort of government bonds and government subsidies. So that obviously de-risks for them a significant amount um, you know, of uh, uh, putting a, an, an algae biofuels business in play. Although, it's, uh, to, to be fair, it's not a true uh, algae biofuels business that they're building. What they're building is a system to sequester CO2 from smokestacks. And then whatever that CO2 gets sequestered in, you are free to use it any way you want. So they're thinking about, you know, they're hoping can, somebody will. Well, they're hoping they're, the, they're, the, they're, yeah. they're hoping they'll get a better value for it, actually, than just no, they fuel. Can sell the CO2. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that they can sell whatever biomass they make from the CO2. So, so you could either capture that CO2, and one of the things they they've kind of learned to do over there is uh, chemically capture it and put it into bricks, and then they're using those in some sort of uh, you know building material. It actually apparently strengthens concrete. Don't don't ask me how, but that that was their their view of it. But but they could also capture this CO2 and algae, and then use that algae to feed. Uh, you know, pigs or cattle or whatever, and that would be a higher value than fuel. That would be okay with them as well. So, um, so the government, in in some places, helps to to get rid of that risk. But I think if you're asking on a technology risk, that's always higher in in a you know in a place that doesn't have a great you know biotech you know sort of hub around it. So there there there's some technical risk to the technology that would be more difficult in developing countries. But on the other hand, your cost of labor is cheaper there, your cost of land is cheaper. So, you know, I, I, I think by and large, many of the algae companies right now are looking in China, in Saudi Arabia, in Morocco, in places that have good 
uh, you know, sort of ge weather, geographical yeah. conditions. So you have good sunlight, good water, maybe even low regulation. You know, it's it's pretty tough to build anything big in California right now, because if you put a ten thousand acre algae pond out there, that is going to have environmental consequences, right? You 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 know, we the biofuels guys would argue that. You know, it's better, you know, to do those and capture the CO2 and not be burning fossil fuel. But but if you put these things out in the Mojave Desert, like the big solar panels that are going out there now, there are people who will show up and say, hey, you're displacing the desert tortoise. And, you know, we're running out of those guys. All right. Mm -hmm. So there's always consequences whenever you put some of this. And so uh, part of the risk is the regulatory consequences of those as well. So, you know, there's there's some things that will be less risky going into developing countries and something, some parts of this that will be higher risk going into developing companies. But by and large, most of the algae companies have weighed that and decided that it's less risky to put these things in developing countries than it is to put them here. Uh, but investors, they like to see projects built in, in a place that has, that they can keep their eye on it. So, so many of the investors want these things built in the United States or Australia or Europe or someplace that's a little closer, and I don't know. Maybe, maybe no, I don't have much. I think that's that's great. I mean, I, algae ponds and are, are simply industrial farming. That's right. Uh, and if you ask where where has industrial farming been successful, the answer is not in developing countries. Right? That's it's, right. It's it's in the Midwest of the U.S. Yes. So on is where you can get these really high yields. Yep. Everything runs, you know, just on time, and it. Uh, uh, it works, whereas as you know, agricultural yields are not as high in, mm -hmm. in developing countries for for reasons that that are a very important puzzle in development economics that we yeah. really really wish yeah, we could yeah, change. Yeah. But we don't we don't necessarily understand why that is, and I, I suppose the risk might be the same with with yep. algae, right? It, so it, you that, can, that, that's exactly right. Um, they call it ecosystem, right? That that it's more than just deploying the technology. That there are lots of other. Um, critical ingredients, some of which can be pretty minor, that are required for the success of that. So, like you say, in the Midwest, agriculture this awesome. works great; it together, just right? comes right yeah. along, and everybody knows how to do it, etc. Try to deploy that same technology in Sub-Saharan Africa hasn't worked at all. But then, interestingly, deploy that technology into Brazil and Argentina, and that's worked fantastic. Yeah, and now happens, they're right? up; yeah. they're yeah. up to to speed with us. So, I I, I think that, but there's a risk, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're trying to measure. And I think most people believe in China, at least, that that ecosystem is there. Um, you know, may, maybe a little lumpy, a little uneven, depending upon what state or province or whatever you're in. Right, but, but you could find a place to. But you can find a place where you can pull this together. off. All right. So I think that's why most people are going there. Interesting. Okay, uh, we're out of time for today. Um, I, I will give Dr. Jacobson one last chance if he wants to say something insightful about the economics of energy and what these students should be doing. Uh, no, I think we've... You're not going to tell them, don't, don't, have, don't uh, buy an electric car because it's bad for pot no magic, holes. No magic for, well, I already told them. Yeah, yeah, so it's, right. uh, no, it's, um, there will be great change, right, in the energy system, yeah. and with it, there will be some some lumps and paying for things yeah. like potholes and electricity infrastructure. Yeah. But I think it's uh, quite possible to sort that out. Right? So it's not making the changes we need to, and, and hoping the price of oil doesn't get too low and put all the renewables yeah. out of business. I think yeah. that's the <laughs> I think that's the yeah. key. Although I I, I will leave this on one last thought then from the environmental side, which is yesterday. Uh, NASA and a group working on that announced that the North Pacific Ocean is the warmest temperature that has ever been measured. Uh, some of you may have seen that there's something called the uh, global uh, climate change hiatus in which the, the air surface temperature has not gone up appreciably in the last uh, 12 years. And uh, some people on the, you know, the, the denier side of things have said, see, the Climate, you know, the, the, the planet isn't warming anymore. The air temperature hasn't gone up. It turns out that the reason it hasn't gone up is because all that heat has been going into the, the oceans, uh, especially the Pacific Ocean. We've known this for many years, uh, but, but the data came in uh, over this summer and the last several months. And, and by the way, if you live out here in California, you know this. Uh, yeah, we, even, we, even the swimming. <laughs> uh, it, it's, 
this summer, uh, you know, sort of a good summer for us because of the way the currents flow here on the West Coast. We might get to 70 degrees. Uh, we were up to 74 degrees for the entire month of August. Uh, and then September, it, it didn't drop much, 72. Uh, I was in the water last week. It's still 68, which is unheard of uh, here in November. And, uh, and then also, uh, you know, we, we'll occasionally get tuna that will come up here in the summertime. They usually show up sometime in July and stay around for August and beginning of September. We not only had yellowfin tuna in record numbers, we had Dorado and then Wahoo. And uh, Wahoo are one of the fish that we have never caught in California before because they like really warm Tropical, water. Yeah. They're, they're, you, you sort of catch those at the tip of Baja and south, and that's about it. And three or four of them were, were caught this summer. So it's been pretty apparent to those of us who actually spend time out in there that it's really warm. And then yesterday, you know, I came out and said, yep, warmest it's ever measured by uh, 0.67 degrees, which is an enormous amount for an ocean the size of the Pacific. And that's going to have significant consequences on the climate, uh, probably the weather too, o over the next year. And so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, that's kind of a, I don't know if that's a depressing note or just an expected one or whatever. All right. And Mark, thanks very much for coming out today. Thank you. All right, students, we will sign off. <laughs>